We are in a series that we started last week on the basics. I'm going to uh, take you into another uh, uh, part of this Christ life. It's going to be a, a well-known part. No one in here is going to be surprised by what I talk about today. We're going to talk about the Word and its place in our uh, foundational existence with Jesus. Uh, but we're going to start by talking about happiness. All in favor of being happy? Okay, good. Turn to someone next to you. The first three things that come to your mind that make you happy, share them. Go. It's always fun to have you just share what pops into your mind. I just want to explain my uh, previous motions there, if you were watching. I wasn't asking for anything but water. Everybody just, you know, okay. Uh, it's not that kind of church. All right. Uh, my, uh, my first three, uh, you don't, everybody say yours all at the same time, right? Your, your first three things were? Oh, I heard all of those. Thank you. Uh, mine, mine, as I sat and, and prepared this morning, uh, I just tried to do it like you just did. Uh, the first things that came to mind uh, were, were my family. Did anybody have family on there? Eleanor's first. I love my kids, but Eleanor's first, okay? And then my kiddos, and, uh, and then uh, certainly my extended family. The second thing is going to be probably different from the rest of you. I had cold weather. Did anybody have cold weather? Love me some cold, baby. Who likes the cold? Anybody sleep with the window open last night? I did. Anyway, uh, and then uh, finally, and I don't know why this came to mind, but strawberry shortcake, and you might guess, but... Uh, there's other things that make me happy, I want to assure you. Uh, but who's got a happy place? Anybody got a happy place? Yeah, I got mine. It's the uh, big leather chair in the corner of my bedroom. It reclines. I'll be there in a few hours taking my Sunday afternoon nap. Yes. Uh, it's my happy place. Uh, anybody have uh, happy memories? Of course we do. That's a dumb question. They usually involve celebrations of some kind. I had the joy last night of sharing with one of our families, Walter and Maggie Rad, married their daughter Michelle off to an amazing young guy. And, uh, yep. Oh, well, there you go. And uh, uh, I got to go to this wedding, and it was a party, right? I mean, Everybody's, you know, everybody that was there was there, and and, uh, and and it was old friends coming in, people that I met 20 years ago that served at our church staff, just all kinds of people were hanging out. I'm sitting across from them, we're reconnecting, there's loud, happy music, uh, there's great food, that comes up again, sorry. Anyway, and, uh, and then we got the dance. Does anybody like the dance? It's hard to not be happy when you're dancing, unless you hate dancing, which, okay, sorry for you, but, uh, but for the rest of us, you know, when the... Well, you, you know, the, you, just, you start feeling it and, and popping and locking. I know Jerry pops and locks. Anyway, uh, uh, there's just joy, right? Isn't God so good to give us happiness, right? It, it's what all of us are looking for in some form in life. It's going to vary in its, in its, you know, its final uh, form, but uh, uh, it's, it's what we're about. In fact, our forefathers, who, who, who took the class that taught you the Constitution, right? You know these words, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator, God's in the Constitution, with certain unalienable rights that among these are, anybody know? Life, liberty, and what's the last one? Yeah, it's us. It's, it's downright American to be happy in life. So what does happiness have to do with these basics that we're talking about? You'd be pleased to know that one of our basics actually cracks the code on happiness in all things for all time. And here it is. The Bible in many places states in fact, emphatically that knowing and living the word of God is the only way to have a truly happy life. Anybody got one of these today? These are far less frequently used in life. Anybody, go ahead, throw it up. What's up, big guy? Good to have you. This is mine from college. Anybody got theirs on this? Who's using one of these right now? Okay, that's fine. It works. But understand that wherever God's word lives, happiness is possible. If you will only uh, know, seek to understand and ingest what God has to tell you in his revealed word, then the Bible says you can experience what it is to have true happiness in life. I formed that sentence uh, pretty carefully. 
Uh, I, I didn't just say know the word of God, I said live the word of God, right? Because we can all know things and not live them and they don't do us any good. It's not enough to know the traffic laws. If we fail to heed them, everybody agree? It's gonna kind of be trouble out there, okay? Um, I don't know if you know this, but our parking lot is a driver's ed course for all the families of our church. <laughs> Did you guys know that? So uh, I, I, I'm not saying every one of you have done this and some of you are like, really? Oh, good. Uh, <laughs> But many of our families have brought their, you know, their young drivers up here to just kind of tool around our parking lot and learn how the pedals work and all that stuff. Anybody taught a kid to drive? It's terrifying. It is the most, one of the most terrifying experiences of my life to sit next to my you know, 15-year-old son, Ben, uh, when it was time, and, and cede the power of uh, controlling a vehicle, right? On a road. Oh, I'm going to get nervous here if I keep talking. But uh, there's safer places to do that. And so people come up here, right? Uh, and, and kids get behind the wheel knowing some of the basics. The one on the right makes it go, right? The, 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 the skinny or the whatever, the, the long one in the middle makes it stop. I'm talking about the pedals. Some of you are like, what are those? Uh, uh, this will steer it, right? Uh, but they, they're not used to it. They haven't uh, done what they've known to do. And sometimes there's failures. Uh, one of the families in our church, their daughter, um, got the pedals mixed up and ran over the bushes over here, uh, uh, much to their chagrin and my delight because I get to tell stories. But uh, 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 it's what we talked about last week. Uh, we reap what we sow. And, and, and if, if we aren't experienced in doing the things that, that we know, uh, well, we're just going to reap a different harvest. Um, I also wrote there that the word provides the only way to a truly happy life, because I'm not up here saying that you can't be happy in some form uh, apart from God's word in life. Billions of people are doing it, unfortunately, okay? But what I wrote there was that modifier, truly. There's all kinds of happinesses, but there's only one true one. It reminds me of a story I read once in C.S. Lewis's writings. He was talking about the kingdom of God, but we could apply it to the word of God. Um, he, he had driven his car down the, the street that he lived on, and uh, he, he says in the story, I don't know if it was a true one or if he was just kind of making up an antidote, but uh, he, he says that he stopped by this ditch that these kids were playing in from his neighborhood. They were all making mud pies. Anybody grow up making mud pies? Yeah, they were making mud pies in the ditch. And C.S. Lewis um, said, hey, uh, Kiddos, apparently they were well enough uh, known to him that this would be something that they could work out with the family. He says, me and my family, we're heading to the beach, which they had never been to. We're, we're going to go spend uh, this holiday at the seaside. Uh, would you like to go with us? And these kids, not knowing uh, the, the joys that awaited you know, a, a day at the beach, said, no, we'll take the mud pies because these are making us happy now. And so much of the world is dealing in mud pies, these uh, poor substitutes for what only the word of God can truly give. And so if knowing and living the word of God is the only way to be truly happy, you'd figure that everybody would be all in on it. And as I just mentioned, you'd be wrong. Uh, a recent poll in 2021 found that only 50% of Americans ever read the Bible. Now some of you are like, wow, it's good. Uh, but that's like ever, like for the whole year. Pick up a Bible and read it. Only half of us ever do that. Can you guess that it's in decline uh, from the years previous? Yeah. Um, but this, this last year, 2021, I guess two years ago now, 2021 to 2022 uh, uh, saw the steepest and sharpest decline from 50% to 39%. What that represents, just so we're all clear, is 26 million Americans just not bothering with God or his word. It's an understandable trend in a broken world. People are too busy, too distracted, too disillusioned to see the point. But let me give you some good news. There's some other studies that validate what, what I'm teaching today, that there's super value in being um, students of God's word and living what we see there, the center of Bible engagement. I don't know them, but they're on the uh, internet, so they've gotta be real. Anyway. Uh, in 2021, they polled 40,000 people from the ages of 8 to 80 uh, in regards to their Bible reading habits in a study that they entitled, Understanding the Bible Engagement Challenge, Scientific Evidence for the Power of Four. A confusing title, The Power of Four, until you find out what they discovered. Uh, they found out that people who open their Bible, uh, Bibles once 
Well, like uh, in a situation like this. You come to church, we throw it up on the screen for you, I'll let that count, right? But if that's all you get, in all of the measurements that they you know, sought to find, no discernible changes. Even twice a week, maybe you go to a, a sermon like this and hear a Bible passage preached and then you go to a life group or a youth group or some other group uh, where the Bible is openly discussed. <clears throat> Still no difference in the lives of those who experience God's words once or twice. There's a small bump that, bump that occurs when it's a third time but when the day uh, or the number of times that you interact with God's word in a week reaches four, and that's why they called it the power of four, something crazy happens. Like there's palpable differences in the lives of the people who read God's words at least four times a week over the ones who just don't. Here we go. Feelings of loneliness uh, drop 30%. Anger issues drop 32%. Uh, Bitterness in relationship down 40%. Percent alcoholism down 57 percent. Sex outside of marriage, either before or during, drops 68 percent. Feeling spiritually stagnant drops 60 percent. Viewing pornography drops 61 percent. Sharing your faith doubles twice over, goes up 200 percent. And being someone who disciples someone in the faith, same story, increases by over 230 percent. Statistical proof that knowing and living the word of God is the only way to have a tr happy, truly happy life. Well, where does our book make this claim? If you want to turn in the Bibles that you have with me today, we're going to be in my, one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible. It's uh, Psalm chapter 1. So as you're turning there, I'm going to grab some water. Told you it was water. <sighs> The reason that Psalm 1 is one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible, I learned it when I was in fourth grade. I went to this angry Baptist Christian school. And uh, <clears throat> one of my favorite things about being there was every morning, with the whole school would gather and the pastor of the church that I was at uh, would lead us in, in memorizing uh, uh, this particular passage and a few others that I still know, right? Uh, and so Psalm 1 has always, even before uh, I, I fully came online with Jesus and was just kind of a kid uh, going to church, um, this was in my head and therefore in my heart. And I just learned that Psalm 1, this is kind of uh, an interesting note that I'll throw in. It, it wasn't originally Psalm 1. I don't know you know how our Bibles were kind of put together, but um, these ancient transcripts kind of were copied over and over again, and then eventually at some point uh, they were organized into the chapters and verses that you guys and I read now, right? And, and so in, in the original form, the book of Psalms was just a, a collection of the songs, and then someone ordered them, and it's fascinating how they've been ordered. I don't have time to go into all that. But the first Psalm was more like, uh, you know what you read on the back of a book that kind of summarizes what's in the book, Right? It's a, it's a peek as, as to what's coming next. It's a summary, a description of everything uh, in the rest of the Psalter. And so uh, we're only going to get to three verses of it today, but it's a great one to read because if you want to understand the point of the Psalms, Psalm 1 tells you, know the word of God and have a truly happy life. Here's what we're going to get into today. So, uh, Psalm 1 starts with a warning. I call those the happy do nots, okay? Uh, and then it explains the path to happiness, and I call that the happy means, uh, which produces a happy end, uh, which is a description of the happy life. So let's go through those, starting with the happy do nots. <clears throat> it says in chapter uh, one, verse one of Psalms, blessed is the man, let's read it together, that's fun, right? Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Love this. The writer starts with this Hebrew word uh, it's pronounced oshrei, oshrei. And it's translated here, blessed. In other parts of the Bible, um, in the Old Testament, it's rendered uh, actually as the word happy, which is where we're getting this whole theme of happiness. Blessedness is happiness. Happiness, true happiness, is blessedness. Happiness um, is, is understood in the Old Testament through this word oshrei as being favored by God's grace. And so with that in mind, let's go through the warnings. Uh, the psalm doesn't start with the explanation of true happiness. It does the exact opposite. Here's what to avoid. 
if you want true happiness. If you want, it's kind of the path to true unhappiness. Here's how to ruin your life. Psalm 1, verse 1. Three things. Uh, We listen to the wrong ideas, and then we end up lingering and landing in them, and they ruin our life. Can everybody welcome to my or welcome to the stage, my wife, Eleanor. Here she comes. We talked about it backstage. She has chosen today to be the wicked. There you go. I will be the man. Is everybody seeing the verse behind me? All right. So blessed is the man who does not what? So, so here's what happens in life. We're just kind of walking around and then wicked things come into view. And we're like, hi, wicked. Hey, how are you? And what do we do? Well, that's interesting. I'm appe- uh, you know, that's appealing. And what we kind of just take it and we start walking, right? And we're just kind of walking. And I'm, I'm thinking about the things that are not what God wants. They're the wicked things. And then eventually I thought about them so much that I do the next thing. Then I start standing in the way of the sinner, right? And I'm just hanging out in these ideas and in the people who espouse them. And then eventually I've hung out so long that I just come on over here and uh, the wicked take a seat and then I sit down on their lap. I'm not going to do that. Oh, you want? Oh, here we go. Okay. okay. <laughs> I'm trying not to put all my weight on you. Okay. It's good squat. I know. It's good. It's good squat. squat. But this is what happens. Put your sign up. When the man sits down. It starts, thank you. Can everybody give it up for my beautiful wife, Eleanor? Thank you. Can you take them? This is the process since the garden, since sin came into the world. So, uh, the, uh, our enemy, Satan, comes in, and he's the first wicked, and he gives the first wicked counsel. And Eve uh, doesn't physically walk with him, but her brain does. And she starts following his argument. And and eventually she's like, you know what, I might be with you. And she stands with Satan in his idea. And then eventually she sits down. That's when she takes the fruit and eats of it. And sin comes into the world. It's how every sin comes into your life and mine. We refuse the wisdom of God from his word. And we're like, I'll take their word for it. And I'll head in that direction. The lingering and the landing are contingent on the listening. Where we end up in life is determined by the messengers that we allow to lead us, people. And we're all followers. Don't think you're not. I'm a maverick. No, you're not. Try to find somewhere in in the world and not listen to your phone tell you where to go. That's how we do it these days, right? If you don't, if you haven't been there before, hey Siri. Oh. Tell me how to get to so-and-so. And then you just listen to this computer say, go left, go right, stop, and you get out of your car. We follow driving directions. We follow work directions. At least most of us do. Most of us do. If the boss needs something, we seek to give it to him. We, we follow home directions. If we want peace in the house, right? Babe, dad's out of bread. Pick him up some on the way home. Got it. Bread delivered. Spiritual life has the same principles. We have spiritual directors. We choose who we listen to. And unfortunately, there's a lot of noise out, the wor- out there. The world has much to say to us. Uh, when I first came online with Jesus, uh, this is the Bible my sister gave me when I went to college. And uh, it was only in my uh, sophomore year of college that I, I think I really started caring about what Jesus wanted from my life. And so I started studying. And then and, and uh, 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 Proverbs, I, I, I went to Proverbs and I read in chapter two, verse 17, how um, uh, uh, you know, basically the, the, the world is like a harlot in this translation, like a, a woman of the night standing on the street saying, hey, big boy, come on over here. And, and Solomon is, is writing the Proverbs to his sons and he's like, fellas, don't listen to the harlot. You'll want to. Everything in you will we'll seek it, like the sirens in the Greek myths. You'll head towards the rocks. But don't. Instead, listen to me and the wisdom that God has for you from me. If it was only the outside uh, messengers that we had to worry about, that'd be great. But there's an inside messenger in all of us. It's called our flesh, the sin nature. Anybody got that voice? 
I was playing aggravation with my father-in-law. I confess. <laughs> I cheated. I, uh, one time I cheated. <laughs> and here's what happened. You know, dad and I are playing. He, th- th- I won't go into all the rules, but you're, it doesn't matter. I cheated. <laughs> and I'm sitting there, and, 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 and <laughs> before I cheated, there was a voice in my head said, if you cheat, maybe the game will end sooner. <laughs> it's horrible. Another horrible voice, right? Because I wanted to go do something else. But I immediately, when I, immediately after I did that, what was the other voice inside? It's like the, it's like the cartoon guys, right? The, the old you is like, go ahead, just cheat. You know, you can get to the, the game you want to watch if you just get out of here. And, and then as soon as I did it, it's like, are you serious? You just cheated in a board game with your father-in-law. Uh, if that were the extent of it, uh, I don't know, it still wouldn't be okay. But here's the deal. We talk ourselves into all kinds of horrific things and convince ourselves as our own messengers, this is going to be the best. There's no way that this can't work. I'm the smartest guy in the room. Let's go. And into folly and ruin we had. It's why Paul the Apostle, pretty good Christian, everybody agree? That's why he writes in Romans 7 these words, for I do not understand my own actions. I don't get it. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. I get it, Paul. You are a, a sinner saved by grace, and the sinner part's still in there. And you have this choice every once in a while that you make that heads back into old Jew. And old Jew is going to make a mess every time. but you still have a hard time choosing. So it comes down to this, who has our ears? If you're wanting to kind of get a central message from the first verse here, he says, blessed are those who do not listen to the counsel of the wicked. Who's got our ears? What are you uh, subjecting yourself? What messages are you listening to the most? Are you letting your favorite political commentator shape your view of the world? Is it all the fellows that you share a drink with after work? Is it just your mind as you sit and soak on the things that you think are right? Or are you willing to open yourself up to the designer of all that is and find from him what his desire for you would be? Verse one warns us against the path that leads to ruin. Then verse two reveals this better route, the only route for a truly happy life. I call it the happy means. In verse two it says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. The blessed man, the happy man, delights in the law of the Lord. That word delight there is the Hebrew word hephetes. And it's uh, basically a word that means desire or delight. Uh, In the law, it's the Hebrew word Torah. Maybe you've heard that one before. Anybody ever heard the Torah? Uh, It's almost always referring now to the first five books of our uh, Old Testaments. The Jewish uh, faith held that they were the only text uh, that could be held to uh, at the time of this writing. And so that's why Torah was used here. Blessed, happy is the man who delights and desires the Torah, the word or the law of the Lord. And he goes further. He says, he doesn't just delight in it, he meditates on it. Day and night. It's two things, basically. Um, if you want a truly happy life, you will desire and delight in the words and wisdom of God. He'll, you, you'll make God your first choice and ultimately your only choice in every decision that you make in life. Um, I tried to match my clothes today. How'd I do? Shoes match the shirt, right? I even put on the black glasses. Can you feel it? Can you see it, right? Yeah, there's, I don't know why colors work this way, but some of them don't go with each other. Some of you don't know that yet. We'll, you know, we'll keep working on that, but, uh, but some of them don't match. And uh, uh, who, has a tr- who has trouble between uh, navy blue and black? I can't tell the difference sometimes. Some of you are colorblind. I know you can't see any of them. Uh, but uh, um, uh, we try to match. And, and when I think about matchy-matchy in our outfits, I think about uh, God's word and his creation and how they're matchy-matchy. What he says in his word will work in his creation. It's how he's designed it 
to happen. My son Cooper's uh, headlight was going out, and so I told my son, I'm trying to let my kids as uh, grown men, you know, do more of their own fending for self. And so um, I said, Coop, your, your light's going out, let's get a new one. And he went online, and he got an entire kit for the front end of his car. I mean, I don't know where he got this thing off. I think it was off of eBay. But all he needed was a bulb. So first, <laughs> let's send that back, bud, all right? And then let's go. And so we went down to one of the car stores, and I said, we need a bulb for this one. And has anybody ever done this? You're sitting there, you told them the right thing, said the right thing, and they give you the wrong part. Okay, so, so we get back to his house. He's got this little Toyota Prius. Everything is like, you know, the size of a baby's hand. You gotta be, you know, so... Uh, I mean, I'm fumbling with this thing. Anybody uh, know that I'm not super handy? Anyway, uh, uh, I'm trying to figure this thing out. I finally get everything dehoused, de- detached, and, and I try to plug this thing in there, and it's not going. I'm getting so frustrated, and finally, I look at the part number of the old bulb compared to the new one, and it's not the same bulb. So I could have sat there forever just trying to jam this thing in, and even if I had gotten it in, what was going to happen? No light. Why? It doesn't fit. That's why we read God's word. From God's word, we discover the parts that fit. The way this is meant to work. It has to be our first choice. And when things get tough, it needs to remain our only choice. We just sang about it. Trust the Lord, right? Yeah, but it's taken too long. Again, I say, Trust the Lord. Yeah, but I had this great idea. Don't listen to you. Trust the Lord and persist in his ways. The second thing it says there is to meditate on his words and his wisdom day and night, which means always is a great Hebrew word. You ready? You're going to say it with me after I I say it the first time. Haga. Haga. Isn't that a great word? It's like a karate word. Haga. It's fun. And it got, it's, it's an onomatopoeia. Who remembers that word from school? Anybody remember that word? It's a word that sounds like what it is. And it basically means to murmur. Haga, 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 haga. And it became the word for meditate in the Hebrew language. It's like what you and I would do before the quiz uh, began. Anybody remember like the vocab quiz or some quiz like that where you just had to cram your short-term memory with like a list of 10 words? Anybody remember those? Right, and you wouldn't study because you're me. Ha. And so you'd get to class that morning, and you'd be like, oh, quiz, vocab quiz. And you'd quick scan all the words and their meanings, and you'd just start reciting them over and over again. Haga, 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 right? So that it would go in here and end up here, and hopefully you didn't fail seventh grade, right? <laughs> this is what we see in the Jewish faith, even today. I mean, it's always been, but the Jewish religion has always been a meditative religion on its word. I stood in an airplane uh, as late night we were flying to Israel. It was full of Orthodox Jewish men, and uh, many of them would stand up in the middle of the night because they take literally, meditate on his word day and night, and they would hold their scriptures open and just kind of rock like this next to their seats. And in the, in, the, in the quiet of the uh, engine's din, they'd just be saying the Hebrew words that they were reading out loud. And I remember looking at them being like, wow, that's dedication. That, that's purposing. That's why if you've ever seen a, a picture like this one, uh, where a Jewish man has this box on his forehead and maybe uh, uh, his left arm is, is wrapped up in, in a, a leather strap with another box up near his, his bicep. Um, this comes from uh, some verses in Deuteronomy called the Shema, at least the first part of them. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, it says, Hear, that's the Hebrew word Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Um, and these words that I command you shall be on your heart. Uh, verse 7 says, and here's a parallel to chapter uh, uh, 1, verse 1 of Psalms. You shall teach them diligent to, you, to your children, and you shall talk to them when uh, you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. Can you picture the totality of that, right? And it's kind of the same thing that we saw in verse 1. Uh, here's where we get these, uh, these boxes, the tefillin or tefillin, I'm sorry, I said it wrong, uh, of, of the Hebrew faith. It says, you shall bind God's words uh, as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. You'll be everywhere. And so there's scriptures in those boxes. 
Uh, and the reason that they wrap them around their, their heads and around their arms is that this uh, means the word's going in my brain. And I give my brain to the word of God, that box. And this one is near the brachial artery, uh, the left side of your body where the heart resides. And my heart is given to God. My mind and my heart are yours and your words. Uh, we obviously generate out of this Jewish faith. And so we are called in our time, in our ways, to this same sort of meditation, this same haga when it comes to God's word. If I can kind of put it in some different terms, uh, haga in our day means to let God's word occupy your mind. Um, anybody here uh, a serial screen open, opener on, on your devices? Like on your computer or your, your iPads or whatever, you got every app opened at all times. Is anybody this way? You make people like me crazy, all right? Shut some of your windows, all right? I can't, I, I just can't, I just, I just can't. <laughs> but here's what, uh, what basically we're being told here in Psalm uh, chapter one, verse two. One screen, one box open. We're focused on God's word and his purposes for us. And we're not listening to the noise. We're filtering everything out. You know, uh, sometime this week I'll uh, cook my father-in-law some more potatoes, some mashed potatoes. If you're not familiar with the process, usually you boil them. And then what do you got to do? You got to take those potatoes and drain them. We throw ours in a colander and all the, the soupy starch water that is the potato goo uh, comes out with the, with, the, with the water through the colander and we're left with the good potatoes and we're on our way, right? And this was what meditation was meant to do for the Jews at the time and for us in our day is that we are so in tune with what God wants, so meditative and so um, uh, you know, aware of his preferences for our life that everything else gets filtered out and all that's left is him. Meditation also means to rewire or renew, as it says in Romans 12, to renew our mind, to clean out the snarls and the tangles that short-circuit life and replace them with God's truth. If we do this, listen, if we avoid the path to unhappiness, which is walking, sit, uh, standing, and sitting with the stupid. Sorry, I didn't mean that to refer to my wife who was just up here, but, uh, but that's what wickedness is, stupid. Stupid is as stupid does. St. Forrest. Uh, if we want a happy life, we choose to meditate on God's words. We choose to desire and delight in his words above all else. And then we get the reward of verse three. Read it with me. He's the person who does this, the happy man who does uh, what first two commands is like a tree planted by streams of water that yield its fruits in season and its leaf does not wither and all that he does, he process, uh, prospers. What basically uh, the psalmist is saying here is like, hey man, uh, the, the happy man is the one who's in his word. They're rooted like a tree planted by streams of water. They're fruited, ah, I made it rhyme, uh, and they yield their fruit in its season. They're blooming, their leaf never withers and they're booming. Ah, rhymes. Because everything they do prospers. And some of you are like, well, Mark, I'm not prospering. Yeah, really? I mean, maybe not on a material, physical, you know, physical or, or, or uh, health-wise level. But if you are in Christ and Christ is in you, let me just kind of familiarize yourself with your setting. Boom it. You're okay. If you have figured this out, you and Jesus are booming no matter how much dooming is going on in your life. These are the first three verses. They're a de facto description of what a perfect man would be. Jesus, anyone? Would it surprise you to know that Jesus knew the word? 78 times in the Gospels alone, Jesus quotes the Old Testament. When Satan comes to tempt him in John chapter four, Luke, John, one of the fours, what does Jesus do? With every temptation, he says, here's what I think. Here's what I heard today while I was at Chipotle. Is that what he does? No, he says, it is written. And he quotes the word that he wrote. <laughs> so what now? Let's finish. Load and store the word, people. Meditate. A little bit later in the Psalter, 
in Psalm 119, the longest chapter in our Bibles, um, the psalmist writes there in verse 11, I've stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Store it up, people. How do we do that? Look at me. We read it. Okay, I, I started this sermon talking about the one-timer, two-timers. That's a bunch of us in here. No shame, but let's stop that, shall we? God gave us his word. Let's eat. Let's ingest what we have from him and learn from him. I'm challenging everybody in here. Four times this week, read the Bible. How much you read is up to you. In fact, let me give you some uh, good clues. Anybody got the U version on their uh, phones? Some of us aren't as app savvy, but there's a great version of the Bible that you can get on your phone or computer or uh, you know personal device called U version. And if you just scroll down the first couple uh, you know uh, screens there, you'll see reading plans. And there is a reading plan for every situation in your life and, and, and every duration in your life, and you, you don't even have to think about it. It will send a prompt to you and say, read this. And if you get really good at it, like our middle schoolers have, you can start talking to people in your life group about what you're reading. You can share the same reading plans. It's awesome, right? But what I'm telling you is there's absolutely zero excuse for any of us saying, you know what, I just don't know how to read. Or I don't, I mean, some of you, sorry. But I don't know how to read the, I don't know when I could read or what I should read or whatever. We have the time to do whatever we want to do. And we have the resource that God has given us. Dig in. Read his word. Hear his word. Listen to good sermons, like I pray this one might have been. And, and, and listen to other people. Uh, expound God's word correctly. Discuss the word with other word loaders. Go to a life group. We're going to be talking about that in a couple weeks. Find other Christians that you can you know, uh, bounce God's word and what you're learning from it uh, off of each other. Share it with non-word loaders. What's that, Mark? Non-Christians. Uh, put it out there. I was at this wedding last night. The best man's speech was a sermon. And he closed with like four passages. And if you've ever been to a wedding, you know, usually it's like, yeah, I remember the times that we got this and that, and, you know, and, uh, and, and, but this guy's speech, I'm not saying everybody has to do it this way, but this guy's speech was like, hey, man, thanks for being a great Christian guy, and if, if it's okay with everybody, I'm just going to read a few passages as we close here. And we got to the end, and people were like, do we clap? I don't, is, should we pray? I don't know. Uh, and he did pray. He prayed. He totally prayed at the end. And, and, uh, uh, and I'm like, way to go, bro. Captive audience. You know, most of them probably Christian or Christian-y, right? But a bunch of people in there don't know Jesus at all. Drop it like it's hot, right? That's Snoop Dogg. Anyway, all right. Uh, <laughs> memorize it. Get all haga with the word. Meditate on it. Know it. Memorize it. I'll give you one to start. John eleven thirty five. Repeat after me. Jesus wept. You did it. You memorized God's word. You, you, you have to work harder to remember the passage name than the actual verse itself. But there you go. You're on your way. Memorize more and have it so that when you need it, it's there. The last thing I'll say to you is this. Use the word, of, uh, the word to light your way. A little bit later in that same Psalm 119, it says, uh, familiar. Anybody know this one? Your word it's a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Here's the picture. Back then it wasn't, you know, these um, mag light, you know, searchlight beams. It was a little oil lamp. And if you wanted to walk around uh, in, in, you know, the first century of, uh, back when this, it was 3,000 years ago. So if you wanted to walk around and, and find your way in the dark, there wasn't any street light haze. It was just the stars and you and whatever it was in front of you, and you would take your lamp and you would just bend over and you'd be like, all right, next step. And a lot of times, let me just tell you this, a lot of times the word's not gonna you know, give you every step for the next 50 and light up your life with all of the answers that you desire, because this is what frustrates people when they start with the Bible. I want all of it and I only got this much. That's all God wants you to do, is put the lamp down by your feet and let the word of God lead you in the next step. Trust the Lord, and he will make your path straight. That's all I got for us. Can I pray? Father, we thank you for your word. And I know I'm preaching to the choir, at least some of them, uh, who read your word every day and who have uh, already uh, understood that it's the only uh, true means of finding uh, real and lasting happiness in life. For the rest of us who are kind of catching up on that, 
Uh, lead us this week to what your word says. Help us to find a reading plan. Um, if, if I don't even know where to start with that, start us in the Gospel of John and let me get to know Jesus from what John writes there. But just start us and give us discipline in connecting with you, knowing that it makes a difference in our lives. Help us to understand your design so that we can live out um, what it is in your creation. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen.